and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Bojong about breeding better edamame varieties for production in the United States. Edamame, or edible soybean, is a popular snack. However, due to a lack of U.S.-specific soybean varieties, domestic production hasn't been able to keep up with consumer demand. In this episode, Bo discusses her work breeding varieties that are better suited to U.S. growing conditions, all while improving characteristics consumers enjoy. Don't forget to listen to the end of the show for our student spotlight. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but before we dive in, we want to thank our sponsors. Starting with Gazmat Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FTIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time simultaneously from static or automated chambers and ruminant emissions. Visit www.gasmet.com, that's gasmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gasmet.com for more information. Our second sponsor is Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today we have Bojang with us. Bojang is an associate professor and soybean breeding lead at Virginia Tech. She received her PhD in cell and molecular biology at the University of Arkansas and then worked at Bayer Crop Science and Virginia State University before joining Virginia Tech. Hi, Bo. How are you doing today? Good, good. How are you, Abby? I am doing super well. I am so excited to talk to you today. So we are talking about soybean breeding today and specifically for edamame. So to get us started, can you just tell us a little bit more about edamame on a high level, maybe some um, statistics on kind of the state of edamame uh, farming in the United States and kind of some of the differences between edamame and soy in general? Sure. Sure. The vigorous growth in the demand for edamame, edamame is edible soybeans over the past two decades, estimated at a 12% to 15% annually, is a prime example of the diversity and the success of the U.S. specialty crop industry. Edamame has quickly become the second largest soy food consumed in the U.S., around 25,000 to 30,000 tons annually. To my knowledge, in the United States, Three states, including Arkansas, Maryland, and Tennessee, have edamame industry. We don't really know how many acreage or how many edamame are produced from the three states because these are the business secret. The difference between edamame and the soybeans in general, the first difference is maturity. Edamame is harvested immature, which is their green color. And soybean seeds, their harvest mature, their yellow color, just like sweet corn and seed corn. Number two difference is water content. Edamame has 60 to 70% moisture, but a soybean seed has 13 to 15% moisture. Number three is the seed size. Edamame seeds have very large seeds, which is bigger than 25 gram per hundred seeds when they are dry. For soybean seeds, they're usually less than 18 grams per hundred seeds. Number four difference is when we plant the edamame, we put six seeds per foot. When we plant the soybeans, we usually put eight to 10 seeds per foot. Emergence is another difference. Because edamame has large seeds, the emergence rate is really lower than soybean seeds. For example, the edamame may emerge about 70 to 80 percent, but uh, soybean seeds yearly emergence rate is 85 percent. Another difference I can see is the harvesting. 
we cannot use cow mine that be used for soybean harvesting to harvest edamame. We have to use the green bean harvester to harvest edamame because edamame beans are soft. And we have seen the producers using oxybol green bean harvester to harvest edamame. So can you explain the difference for between like a combine harvester and a green bean harvester for people who are not out in the field? So for the combine harvester, you cut up the plants and then you stretch the beans out of the pots and you harvest only the beans. For the green bean harvester, you do not cut off the plants. You are pulling off the pots of the plants. So the stems, the roots of the whole plants are still stay in the field. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I guess that makes a lot of sense. You don't want uh, your edamame seeds getting, um, or pods, I guess, getting getting damaged by other, that other plant material. I ask because I'm always so interested to hear about different types of farm machinery because I, I don't know the difference um, between any of them. So that's really neat. I like that a lot. So here's a question about... I, you've mentioned already that edamame is obviously soybean that's used for for eating purposes, and soybean are used for other purposes, a variety of other purposes. So uh, soybean oil is one of them. So this is maybe a, a foolish question on my part, but why don't soybean farmers also want those bigger seeds? I mean, is that where the oil comes from, or is that not where it comes from? It's like why I'm curious why they wouldn't all just want soybean to be bigger. <laughs> the bigger seed size does not mean they have bigger protein content or a more oil content. Oh. The reason why farmers do not choose big seeds is because the yield of larger beans or larger seeds is smaller than the regular size of soybeans. For example, the if you choose large beans, which is 20 gram per hundred seeds versus 15 gram per hundred seeds, the yield of large beans is probably 90 to 95 percent of the smaller seeds. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, that makes sense. Is that to do with like the emergence levels of them? Yes, yes. The emergence level is one, one thing. Another thing, just the large seeds tend to have less yield than the smaller soybeans. But if the beans are too small, they cannot produce good yield either. So farmers are considering the profit. And because if you grow just like 15 gram of pregnancies, you have a really good yield potential. Okay. Thank you for answering those supplementary questions that I'm throwing at you. So then your project specifically was kind of hoping to breed some edamame varieties for growth in the U.S. to kind of increase that uh, market, I guess. So to go about this, you had four different kind of categories or uh, categories of methods maybe to address various problems that farmers encounter when growing soybeans. So can you kind of run through the list of those four categories and kind of explain both what those methods mean and achieve, but also the problem that you were hoping to address? Sure. So the first category is related to genetics and the genomics, which is to identify edamame accessions. Accession is the germplasm or the materials from uh, other countries. To identify edamame accessions with large bean size and desired flavor from large CD soybean germplasm collected by USDA through characterization and evaluation of their economic and edamame quality trees in mid south environments. The desired flavor here, we're focusing on high sucrose and high alanine because after we did a sensory evaluation, we found the consumers prefer the edamame beans with high sucrose and the high alanine content. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in real quick before you get to the next one. Um, for the sensory evaluation, is how is that run? 
The century evaluation was run by the food science department at Virginia Tech, and they had 50 panelists to evaluate, I don't remember how many samples, but uh, the samples from uh, three states, because we had um, uh, the trials among three states, Arkansas, Virginia Tech, uh, Arkansas, Virginia, and um, Missouri. And then they tasted the plain edamame, and then they answered a survey. And then the conclusion was the most acceptable edamame sample, they all had high sucrose and high alanine content. Okay. Um, I'm always curious about that because I love the idea of science projects that feature just like eating different <laughs> versions of the same yes. thing. <laughs> yeah. Please continue with your list of methods. Sure. The second category in the project is related to reading and the phenomics. So the, the goal is to implement desired plant architecture and the rapid canopy closure from green soybeans into edamame accessions with high quality beans. The plant architecture we're talking about here is the plant height and the first part of position. Because the harvester cannot harvest below 24 inches or taller than 36 inches. So for the breeding purposes, we like to develop edamame plants with plant height between 24 to 36 inches. And the first part position should be taller than three inches, so no pass will be left in the field during harvest. The rapid canopy closure is preferred by growers because the rapid canopy closure in the field can suppress the weed pressure. The number three category is related to food science, phenomics, entomology, weed science, plant pathology, and breeding to release improved agamami cultivars for mechanical harvest through the evaluation of current large seeded advanced green soybean breeding lines on plant architecture, canopy closure, and sensory. The last one is related to extension outreach to disseminate, discuss, and educate stakeholders about edamame variety selection and the quality attributes and the production practices through extension activities. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Bo's paper, BT Sweet, a vegetable soybean cultivar for commercial edamame production in the mid-Atlantic U.S., published in the Journal of Plant Registrations, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsors, Meta Group and Gazmat Technologies. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. For Gasmet Technologies, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work weighing 20.7 pounds. The GT5000 Terra is splash-proof IP54 rated with an internal pump and battery and instantaneous readings of up to 50 gases at sub-PPM concentrations. Check out the quick setup guide and learn more about Gasmat Technologies at www.gasmat.com and the links in the show notes. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Okay, so yeah, you had kind of these different categories to bring out these desirable traits, those bigger, sweeter pods, um, you know, making it easier for the farmers to harvest these plants, which I just love that you have to kind of custom design a plant, um, take those things into consideration when, when you're breeding these plants for these different types of machinery and farming methods. I just love that interface. Um Thank you. Be between uh, the 
the technology and the plant itself. Um, that's a really fascinating aspect here. So then, um, obviously, you did a lot of research. We've kind of touched on how you went about some of that. But what did you find? So we found actually a lot of uh, exciting results. But uh, I have four highlighted results here. The first one is Adamami Cultivar VT Sweet has been released for commercial production. So if you want to have any seeds, just let me know. And we use the data on the part weight dimensions and relative maturity. We found eight edamame sessions from other countries can be used as print lines in edamame breeding, which is available to everybody. And we have identified 13 significant genetic markers associated with fast canopy closure. Thousands of images have been collected to study shoot architecture and pot location. Potato leaf hopper, Mexican bee beetle, defoliators, and stink bugs are popular insects for edamame. Edamame has the same diseases on plants and roots as soybean, but it has unique pod diseases, which is under the investigation. Edamame trials has been conducted to evaluate advanced breeding lines from Virginia Tech, University of Arkansas, and the University of Missouri for future release. The media and price and extent activities such as field day and virtual field day have helped the team to disseminate the research findings. So one thing that's always interesting to me is how people kind of disseminate their research and get things out there. Um, so I do want to talk in, about that a little bit more. But I'm also curious, like, what is the process like for once you have bred a soybean accession that you feel is ready to put out into the world. How do you go about actually getting that released? I mean, are you working with farmers to grow that initial seed for you? Is that a lab thing? How does that whole process work? So I'll say there are two aspects we need to do. The first one is about the license. The second one is about the seeds. So we work with our release committee at the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Virginia Tech. The committee needs to prove your release application. Once the application is approved, we contact the potential licensees. So there are two ways to release the variety. One is to uh, release it, it publicly the other way is to release it privately. So if it's released privately, there's another another office at Virginia Tech, it's called a VT, it's Virginia Tech Intellectual Property Office. And they will help you to identify which licensee is, is the winner among all the, the bidders. Because the VT office collects all the bids about your variety and we will work with one, maybe more than one licensees. So once we have this license agreement between Virginia Tech and the private company, the seeds will be produced by Virginia Crop Improvement Association. So we provide, as a breeder, we provide the breeder seeds to Virginia Crop Improvement Association, and they produce certified seeds, foundation seeds, and then the private company will buy seeds from a Virginia Crop Improvement Association. If it's a public release, the farmers can go to Virginia Crop Improvement Association to buy the seeds directly from them. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that is really interesting. I feel like there's so many things about that process that um, are really yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, but for for the sake of respecting your time, I will not I will not indulge every question <laughs> oh. that I that I want to dive into today because um, I'm sure I could just pick your brain for hours about this topic. So, but there is one that just kind of occurred to me as we were talking that I want to ask you before we move on to the extension side of things, um, and that's kind of how do you know when a like when an accession is done. I mean, breeding obviously is 
um, this very cyclical process of iteration and improvement over time. And I know some some of that might be driven by if there's a very pressing, you know, weed or disease threat that's happening or what have you. But I also know, you know, it takes a lot of time to develop these. So how do you know when you're like, this is the right one that we want to choose? We're not going to tweak it anymore. We're not going to do any more generations or what have you. Like, how do you make those decisions as a team? That's a very, very good question. I'll answer the question in two aspects. The first one is the commercial needs. For example, I have a collaboration. It's not on Edamame. I have a collaboration with a, a company called the Montego Farms in Virginia because they like to export the food grade soybeans. So I develop food grade soybeans, particularly for them. So I know the trees they want, and then they have their customer's evaluation. So I sent samples to Montego Farms. Montego Farms sent the samples to his customers and the users. And the uh, end user will have the feedback to Montego Farms and then eventually back to me, and then they will pick which one they like. So once Montego Farms and the user identified which varieties they like, and we have the willingness to release that variety. So that's based on the commercial production or commercial needs. But all the samples that send it to Montego Farms, they have to pass my field evaluation. So that's another aspect. Anything we release from here, we have tons of yield trials. So from the first year to start making crosses to develop this variety, until the last year to release variety that may take eight to 10 years. So in the last four or five years, we evaluate the particular variety. In Virginia trials, we have three to five locations every year. And then in the last two years, we send the samples to, we call uniform yield trials in the South. We call Southern uniform yield trials. So each variety will be tested every year 15 to 20 locations, so we know how stable the performance is and how good the variety is. So two aspects, the commercial demand, commercial needs, and the, the performance in the field. Wow, I did not realize quite how long, uh, what a long process that is. I mean, I knew it was a multiple year process, of course, but yeah. Wow, that's that's a long time. Um, yeah. Are you working on like like how many varieties are you working on simultaneously during that time? Yeah, every year uh, we are working on about two hundred fifty varieties for the next stage of a regional trial. Wow, that's so many. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot to keep straight. Um, right. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. So I I will curtail myself yet again <laughs> uh, and, and keep moving us forward here. So um, I did want to ask about the extension, though. So that's kind of – like once you've released it, are, are these field days like concurrent with – the development of the seed to try and get people interested? Is it on a farm once you've released it and people are learning about it? Like, what do these outreach activities look like for you? As a breeder, we have soybean field day every other year. At the soybean field day, we present the progress of our varieties and which one is available and which one is new. And we also present the research projects like behind the breeding because all the breeding projects is established based on the needs of breeding purposes. And we also have soybean extension specialist at Virginia Tech, Dr. David Holzhauser, and he's, he's presented a lot of his research projects at um, the, their field days, like uh, 
the maturity, uh, like um, when to plant a full season crop, when to plant double crop soybeans. And um, I know some other people who has extension appointments, like pathologists, entomologists, they usually have a forecast of what's going on or what's, it, what's coming in the future in, maybe for this season. Wow. That's super interesting. So then are are the people that are being invited or attending these field days primarily farmers or yeah. are they interested public at all or not really? So the majority of farmers, and we do see a good amount of extension agents because the extension agents of each county and they need to learn like update their knowledge for this season or for the cure crop and for some recent projects and they can examine it more, the risk fund is to the farmers they work with in case they, they cannot come to the extension activities. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, so then moving on, obviously you had a lot of really fruitful research from this project in a lot of different directions and areas. So what is next for these research projects um, in any of these four areas? The future goal is to produce and optimize a domestic supply chain of edamame to increase the diversity and the long-term sustainability of the vegetable industry in the U.S. For this project, we focus more on plant development and the production. In the next project or the future research, we want to com combine all the elements on the supply chain, especially we want to put more uh, effort on marketing and economics to make the supply chain connected. So we want to gather all expertise from the fields involving the supply chain to produce and optimize the domestic supply chain. And we have done that a little bit. In December last year, we had a National Edamame Workshop in Charlotte, North Carolina. We had uh, stakeholders and uh, expertise from university and the USDA institutions. We got together, we identified the needs of the um, establishment of the domestic edamame supply chain. And then we had really clear objectives. Now we're waiting for funding to let us work together to pursue um, the research projects. Well, wow, there's so much that goes in to, I mean, from start to finish here, I'm just amazed constantly by how much it takes to get from, you know, pardon the pun here, but the seed of an idea and then all the way in, like, on to consumer shelves. <laughs> yes. What a journey. <laughs> Yes. Um, but very rewarding and obviously very important work, I'm sure. Um, so I've got three questions left for you today. So the first one is if people want to learn more about any of the things we've talked about today, where can they go for more information? We do have a website of um, this project. Um, I can give you the website the link so you you can share the link with your um uh, audience yeah we can for sure add a link to that in the show notes so then the second question is if people want to take the next step and get involved with edamame production in the u.s um in any way what can they do i would say to get involved in edamame is to consume more edamame and pursue local produced edamame because now 70% edamame is imported from other countries. And we need to support the domestic edamame production and, the, of course, support local produce. Sure, sure. Um, great, great advice across many crops. Um, so then final question for you is if... Uh, what is one fact that listeners would not know about you if all they had was your current research? The fun fact is eat the beans. The fun fact is eat edamame beans, not a pause. 
a friend complained to me that edamame pods were so nasty, too much fiber to swallow. I said, no, I said, do not eat the pods, only the beans, just like a peanut. Mmm. Yeah, that's a... Uh... <laughs> I think I think it would be easy to to make that mistake because you would think like a like a snap pea or something. Yes. Um, you kind of just eat the whole thing. Right. Is there is there a specific way to like best peel a, a edamame pod? Yes, you hold the pods on the side, and then you squeeze the beans out of the pods into your mouth. Oh, okay. So you don't even need to like tear it apart you kind of just no. bust it open oh okay yes. clearly i need to eat more uh local edamame so i can get some practice in that's great um well yeah this has been a lovely conversation it's been so great to talk to you and learn about this uh maybe lesser known crop in the u.s um thank you abby for this opportunity to interview me yeah, yeah, it's love, been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I love more people can eat more edamame, so in turn, it will support our breeding program. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, uh, Bo. It's been a pleasure, and thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Jyoti. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Uh, thank you, Abby, for your invitations. And I'm Jyoti Gakati, and I am from India. Uh, I am a PhD student at Clemson University, South Carolina, and I'm working with Dr. Shruti Narayanan at the Department of Plant and Environmental Sciences from last two years. Wonderful. And what are you currently researching? Uh, presently, I'm working on two projects based on soybean. In one of the projects, we are looking how we can improve the drought tolerance of soybean during emergence phase. And here we have screened more than 300 soybean genotypes for emergence under dry soil conditions, put in the greenhouse as well in the field conditions. And we have find few contrasting genotypes based on emergence. And now we are looking for the chemical compounds using the metabolomic approach. We are finding how they are different in the, both in the seed as in the uh, root mainly. And later, based on this result, we are planning to develop some seed treatment chemicals which can improve the emergence under dry soil conditions. So in another project, we are looking how the heat and drought stress affect the oil and protein quality or quantity in soybean when the stress is imposed during the seed filling stage. So we have already completed the preliminary work for uh, this work and we are just on the process of publications. So you will be finding the results very shortly. Thank you. Great. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? Yeah, as I have mentioned, like I am from India, so I have seen the food security problem in both in the developing country as well as uh, in the uh, developed country. Like now I can make a comparison between the developed and uh, developing countries. So I, in near future, I would like to work on the food security stuff, mainly for the developing countries. And on the other hand, I also have a plan to work for the NASA's Plant Biology Research Program. And I am making myself competent for that post. Uh, presently, I am working on metabolomics and lipidomics stuff and making uh, my skill sets. And, and earlier also, during my undergrad and post and like master programs, I have skill set on uh, molecular biology plant tissue cancers and microbiology because I did uh, my post-graduation in biotechnology from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So I think I would make myself very competent for the positions as well. Awesome. Well, if anyone would like to get in touch with Jyoti about his work, we'll have his contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you very much. Thank 
thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.